Hi, I'm Melin Johnson, and we're happy to have you here with us today with On the Bricks. And our show today is the second part of the Breakfast and Business series. And I have Sally Hawkins with Bank of the Panhandle to introduce. Good morning. Thank you guys for coming. Um, we're uh, glad to have you. If you haven't, grab some cinnamon rolls. I was telling everybody they're very easy. Um, this morning we're going to talk about capital and cash flow and we've got our credit analysts, so the really smart people, to talk to you about it. It's, it's over my head a little bit, but we've got Lisa Phillips and Coulter Hedrick. Good morning everyone. Thanks for joining us. Sally said if you need breakfast, we have breakfast, so feel free to get up, refill your coffee, refill your cinnamon roll. <laughs> Anyone? Okay. I'm Lisa Phillips. I'm a credit analyst here at the bank. I've been here six and a half years. They've flown by. Uh, Coulter Hedrick is a little newer. He's also a credit analyst and he has some other banking backgrounds. Um, we primarily underwrite commercial loans here at the bank and I never really know if that means anything to people so I try to explain when a loan officer goes out and makes new friends and they have a project in mind, a hotel they want to build or equipment they want to buy, they collect kind of the business plan, the financial statements and they bring it back here to the bank and then Coulter and I get to work on it. We analyze ratios and we compare that business against the industry and we figure out how many years will it take them to pay for it? Or is this a viable plan? Is it not a viable plan? Then we help with the written recommendation, which will go to loan committee or whoever's approving it. And then once we make those loans, we monitor the health of the business. So hotel, if it's a 15 or a 20 year loan, you can imagine how many ups and downs a hotel might have over 15 or 20 years. So we help monitor the risk for the bank. We analyze those numbers and communicate with the loan officer so that he can communicate with the borrower and say, I've noticed that this expense has gone way up. What's going on? And to have a good working relationship with the customer. So uh, there's lots of other administrative stuff we do and annual reviews and fund reports and daily balancing, but that's the meat of what a credit analyst does. So. We are not accountants or CPAs, but we do stare at numbers and ratios all day. And yes, I sit in front of a computer all day and love it. I'm a numbers nerd. So uh, we um, have put together a presentation for you and hopefully it's not in banker language. And if it is, just say like, oh, okay, just let's give that to me in words that I understand. And so please stop us if we get a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, so let's do some introductions real quickly. If you'll just say your name and what you do, and then maybe what your day-to-day -day looks like in your business. Okay. I'm Lynn Johnson. I'm with Main Street Diamond, and my, I don't ever deal with the bank much, but uh, we love to help businesses to the extent that we can. David Winger, and I'm the Dean of Business and Technology at Panhandle State. I actually teach finance, and so I teach cash flows, and, uh, and I used to, back in my former life, 10 or 11 years ago, I was a farmer, so I did all sorts of cash flow analysis for my farms and things like that, so I kind of like cash flow. Stuff too. I like cash. But I don't You'd like be the expert. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> we might put David in charge here. Oh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I'm Jennifer Williams, and my husband and I own Dizzy Bee's Corner Mart across the street. And we just kind of manage it, run it all day, seven days a week, and hoping to get a lot out of this business training. I'm Susan Clark. I'm the family advocate at the Head Start Center, and I work with the families, the parents that their kids come to the center, but I'm here for personal reasons. Um, my daughter would like to start her own business, so that's why I'm here. I'm Randy Jacobs. I work with PTCI. I'm a business solutions specialist, but I have nothing to do with people's financial side of their business, only in uh, uh, providing services and solutions uh, from the telecom 
part of that. But my wife and I recently bought a business, and so I have kind of a, a double-edged deal that I want to accomplish here. So learn a little bit more about the way that that stuff functions. I'm Molly Scott. I'm opening a health food store soon, and I don't have any cash flow yet, so I'm <laughs> learning how it works. <laughs> my name is Corey Sills, owner of Precision Construction. Um, Two-thirds of my day is spent working and swinging a hammer, and one-third is spent doing paperwork, and every now and then I sleep a little bit. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot of work doing your own thing. Yes, sure. and sleep helps all those numbers fall in order, I'm finding. If you don't have enough yeah, sleep, the numbers <laughs> get a little jumbled. <laughs> um, my name is Shelby Redcorn. and I'm a massage therapist. I take people's worries and stresses away all day. We'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Networking. <laughs> Working together. My name is C.E. Like, um, I don't have a business yet. I just have a few head of cattle. Um, and I'm just here to learn. Okay. Coulter? Oh, yeah, I'm Coulter. Lisa's already introduced me once. Um, I'll be helping with the presentation work here at Bank of Pan Angel as a credit analyst. Okay. Well, today's class is uh, capital and cash flow, as we've talked about. And just an overview of what we have in store for you. Uh, last week we had, so you want to own a business, and you have that recorded, I'm guessing. So if anyone wanted to check it out um, very helpful presentation by Sally today's capital and cash flow next week am I making money uh, September 27th make banking work for you all the different bank products that are available and then in October it switches gears a small business roundtable human resources retirement and succession planning and insurance all kinds of fun stuff which I might need to take part in as well so Small business is not for the faint of heart. It's for the brave, the patient, and the persistent. I found this quote and it really hit home. Owning a business, small business or large business, is not for the faint of heart. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of planning. And I'm sure there will be walls that you'll hit and have to work around. But the good news is there's help at every corner if you ask for it. So don't let those fears stop you from jumping right in. So today, just an overview of what we're going to touch on. We're going to talk about capital, what you need and how you're going to get it. Um, some sources of capital. There's different places you can go asking for that money. And we'll talk about each briefly and its pros and cons. Then we'll get into cash flow. Um, it's the timing of cash in and the cash out. So it's the heartbeat of your business and what keeps it alive. And then since this is kind of our specialty applying for a bank loan, one of those sources of capital is to go to a bank and apply for a loan. And uh, that sounds scary. We just got virtual mailboxes on our printer and that sounded really terrifying, like hmm. virtual mailbox. It's not terrifying. It's, it's really easy. So we'll walk through that process. And if you have questions, we'll answer those. Okay, so raising capital. A good place to start in raising capital is to figure out how much do I need? I have this business, what does this business need? Especially a new business that you're starting up, what are the needs going to be of the business? And some of those needs would be, I'm gonna need cash to operate. I'm gonna to have to have cash to start with to pay some of those initial bills. I'm also gonna need supplies, uh, cleaning supplies, towels, whatever those supplies might be that are typically reused than inventory. There's a good chance if you're in retail that there's some inventory you're going to need to sell in order to make money. So when you open those doors the first day, there's got to be something on the shelf that you can sell to your customers. So you're going to need some inventory and then good chances you're going to need some equipment. Even if that's a computer or a printer, it might be a backhoe or something larger. So when you're working through this capital, when you're working through this, um, Make a good list and think about all the things that this business is going to need and then total it up. And I think um, an old Forbes study said the average business needs 30000 And I kind of thought that was small. But it might be 5000 that you need. And if this is an existing business, you might determine that I could really do a lot more work if I had more equipment and I need to spend fifty or 100000 in, in equipment. So how am I going to get the money to finance it. So how will I pay for these things? Well, 
You could go dig up all the piggy banks that you have been burying in the backyard, or you could borrow from an unsuspecting friend, or pass the hat, or I have yet to find a money tree, but you could also find a money tree. But I think that there's more tangible ways to find some money to fund your project, and so Coulter is gonna cover some of those things. Um, some of these you might already understand, um, but hopefully, if there's some of your little iffy about, we'll kind of bridge the gap. Self-financing is a pretty common <coughs> method. Um, as you can see up there, it revolves pers personal savings, self personal assets. Sometimes you'll have to go into your retirement fund and pull out. Uh, the biggest thing with that, the risk is, if it fails, it's all on you. So there could be a lot of risk involved with that if you take that route and decide to pull out all your retirement and your venture doesn't work out. We don't have any money to retire on. But on the positive side, say it does work out, you don't have to spend an interest rate. Uh, family and friends. This one's a pretty common method. I, uh, Pepperdine University did a study in 2015. Um, from the small businesses that responded to their survey, 68% of them said they'd gotten funding from family and friends. Now, this is also a common, or pretty common method, obviously. They'll probably look past credit scores or account balances, uh, but say you fail, it might make Thanksgiving dinner a little awkward. With that being said, um, that's one of the very common methods. Bank loans, which we'll go into more extensively. Um, common method, you come and apply at the bank. Um, what you'll need to have with them, you'll know you need to lay out a kind of a game plan and they'll be pretty much consistent with rates between you know six to thirteen percent for commercial lending purposes. Venture capitalist is usually someone who will uh, give you a direct investment for a stake in equity in your company. I like to think of that as Shark Tank. If any of you have all seen that, uh, that is exactly what a, a venture capitalist is. An angel investor is someone that will invest in your company that usually is already involved in the same field you are in. Um, so for this purpose, they're just trying to kind of help you get started and they'll also be informative to help you start your business. If you're lucky to find an angel invest investor, um, that's they give a lot of positive input to your company as well as cash flow, ideas, because they usually run the similar type of business that you do. Crowdfunding, pass the hat is kind of what she said. My favorite one, as if you've watched, you know, those ESPN college footballs, the student up in the stands saying, fund me, go to this website. Or, I don't know if you guys remember when Kanye West ran out of money and the internet blew up, fund Kanye West. That's the same, same uh, principle there, pass the hat. There's a lot of online stuff that can connect those um, crowdfunding sources. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer loans, uh, that's, you know, going to your peers, usually non uh, family members obviously getting loans from them and they'll usually look past a lot of the things as well as credit score etc you'll see a lot of these loans um, are getting cash from these if they're kind of involved in the property at stake say they sell you the house you can't qualify in the market um, they'll fund you you know at a certain rate and help you get past some of those uh, things a bank might not see, um, you'd be able to fund. Incubators is kind of an interesting one. It's, it's pretty hard to get into. Um, I did an incubation in college. It's a really neat process. They really start you from the ground up and helping you build your company. I mean, down to the, you know, say if you're uh, making an app or something, they'll help you develop the model. They'll bring in specialists to help and talk to you about how, how to handle this and move forward as well as find potential investors. So you'll do a lot of uh, pitches and stuff in incubations. Um, it's kind of like a job, you go in there, you sit down and you get, you go through all your things that you can in order to uh, make a pitch to a venture capitalist really in the end and so they can provide you cash flow. I think that's, that covers that. Okay, there's a handout in your um, folder called Sources of Capital, and we have listed out some pros and cons of each type. Um, Self-financing, as Coulter mentioned, is 
you cashing in savings or 401k. And some of those I think I would be comfortable with. My savings is there for me to use, but when I start tapping into 401k or using personal credit cards, I get a little more uneasy with how am I going to repay that and is that my best plan, but uh, really depends on how much we're talking, 5000 versus 300000 And that's all a personal choice. People work to save money and you can't take it with you, so you might as well spend it and put it to good use. So um, definitely some pros to that is you will be the sole owner and you get to make those decisions. But some of the negatives are if you're cashing in retirement funds or you're selling other assets, there could be tax implications for those. So really when you're thinking about which routes am I going to want to go, this is a good tool to sit down and sketch out your own pros and cons. That might be different for each person. It might be different for each type of business that you're in. Um, the next section is family and friends. Uh, and as Coulter says, it doesn't usually require as formal of presentation to them. They probably aren't going to check your credit scores, but also if things go south and you're not paying them back, then Thanksgiving dinner might be awkward. And, and that is a great source of funds, but also could be a great source of stress. So just some things to consider as you're making your decisions. Absolutely. Uh, I did a lot of business with my dad. And so we, I borrowed a lot of money from my dad through the years and different things, but he always, we always wrote out a contract and, and had it all, all the specifics written down. And one day I was at the lawyer's office getting all of it, all the stuff done because I was buying a barn from him or something, I can't remember. And I asked the lawyer, I said, do, do most families do stuff like this? And he said, well, no, not most, but he said, this, this is the saying I have. He says, families that do business in a business-like manner won't ever fall out over business you know so I, I thought that's a good that's kind of a good way to approach it so like for myself if i do anything with my family either we do it business-like or i just treat it as a gift i never want to think i'll get it back mm -hmm. so. it helps draw a little clearer line exactly. between yeah. personal <laughs> in business. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for adding that. Um, bank loans is the next section and obviously those will typically come with interest rates and the good part of banks I think is that you can go visit with a loan officer and chances are that loan officer has either dealt with a similar business or knows business and can help uh, ask the right questions for you to think out the plan. The disadvantages are there's probably going to be a down payment involved when someone comes to us and wants 50000 we usually want that person to put some skin in the game as well. I will certainly help finance that, but I also want you to have some of that weight on you too so that we can both come to the table with um, the same goals. It also would require, usually require some collateral and the loan officer again can help you think through what might be good sources of collateral to use for a business loan. So there will be a presentation to the loan officer, but I really think most of the time that goes as a conversation with the loan officer. I don't uh, think of it as an interview by any means. It's nothing to get nervous about. It's just a great networking opportunity for this business venture. Um, most of the business loans we see require a personal guarantee. So we will loan money to the business, but also ask the individual owners to provide their guarantee. So if the business does not work out, then we would seek repayment from the individual. So if bank financing is something you're thinking about, have that in mind that um, there might be some personal liability involved with that as well. Equity method is the next one um, of angel investors or venture capitalists. And these are groups that you're going to asking for money. And that could be a local group, that could be a Shark Tank group. If you make it on TV, we'll all be very excited to watch you. Um, but a couple of different methods, equity method and royalty method. I've seen companies get venture capitalist money and that venture capitalist wants a share of the profits or wants some ownership in your company. And I've also seen companies who eventually were very successful and wanted to buy out that investor, make that investor go away, make it my business now. And sometimes those 
buyout terms are difficult to live with. Sometimes they're factored on how much money you're making. So the more money you make, the more it's going to cost you to buy out that owner. So if you enter a relationship like that, be aware that there might be different things that they're requiring, distributions or payments, or there might be terms in five years that you may not like, that you liked in the beginning. Um, those when when you're getting into those situations I would say seek legal advice for sure get contracts make sure you're thinking out the pros and cons um, of that relationship I've always heard if you're gonna have co-owners like this if they're gonna be an owner in your business then it's like a marriage you should wanna you, you know if you wouldn't marry that person then maybe not get into business with that person because there's gonna be some conversations and some relationship strains through throughout the time. So just know what you're getting into there. Uh, skipping down to crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer loans and incubators. There are great resources out there and the internet is a, doesn't always tell the truth, but it's a great resource to find places. There's an organization called SCORE and it is mainly volunteers that used to run businesses and they get together and you can set up meetings with them and they will counsel you on everything from marketing plans to financing options, um, help you build a business plan, help you study the market. Is this a good time to open a convenience store? Is this a good time to build a hotel? Um, what's the traffic count? So they'll help you get some information. Typically, you're busy running your business or trying to get it off the ground, so it's nice to have experts that can help provide some of that data for you. Score, and I think it's score.org. Is, they get, is it all free, I guess? Yes. Yeah, a lot of times it's through, it used to be through the chamber here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they still have it, but it's kind of like a, a business mentor. A lot of times it's a retired, and you can also, <coughs> you can also get those through your Main Street and, mm -hmm. and chamber. Mm -hmm. And Pretzi, I think, had some data, but. Pretzi is, mm -hmm. is usually mm -hmm. who we send them to. And incidentally, the, the, these classes are sponsored by the Chamber, Main Street, and Pretzi. Mm -hmm. So we all work together. The last section there is other loan programs. Uh, um, getting loans online is fairly popular. We get a lot of Quicken loans, home loans, and they might offer cheaper interest rates, but I think they lack in relationship building, like a traditional bank loan would. Uh, you've probably all called an 800 number and gotten shuffled around and like, I just want a person to talk to. Please just help me. If you need to skip one month payment, it's a little hard to do. Uh, there's not usually an option for that on your touch tone phone. So uh, there are other loan programs available. There are other grant programs available. Uh, if you put your feelers out and make lots of friends, then chances are you will stumble onto a program that's right for you in regards to other loan programs. You need questions on all of that. I know that's a lot of information. How common, like in this area, is, is there very, very many angel investors? Or my idea of an angel investor always is in like Silicon Valley or you know, shark tanker. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, is, is there much of that goes on in, in this area that you know of? Most of what we see is family gifts. Okay. And extended family, and it, particularly in the hotel industry, um, a lot of hotel owners will know of groups of investors. Okay. Um, th they also tend to bank with banks in large cities and large banks, and they can put people in contact with other people. We don't see much of that usually by the time it reaches us they have their investors collected and are ready for financing i think in this area it would be hard to find a venture capitalist or an angel investor that might come in the form of a family trust that has a lot of cash that they'd like to invest in something and they might be getting a low interest rate on their deposits at a bank so they're looking to invest in something that would provide a little healthier return for them. So if you know of any rich family trust that <laughs> are looking to adopt. Uh. <laughs> so does anyone have any experience with any um, 
of these sources of capital, questions about obtaining it? I, um, I've gone to a lot of trainings where different main streets are trying a crowdfunding and we haven't stepped into that, but uh, if anybody would like to be on a committee to try it, what they typically do is invite a certain number of people, and it's, it's a simple meal, like soup and sandwiches, but whomever they invite, you charge $50 a plate or some such. Then you invite three people with a business plan for either a new business or an expansion, you new equipment or something from your area. And they make a presentation then these these that you've invited to the meeting that have bought the tickets actually vote and whatever amount of money came in for that meal goes to them. Mm -hmm. And it's not a huge amount of money, but at some point when you're scrambling i think it would help am i wrong so do the 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 people at the meal they just basically it's a donation or do yes. they get okay there's no like return on that no but okay. if but if somebody if shelby wanted to in her proposal say that everyone there then would receive two massages for right right i mean she could propose something that there was something in return, but no, not typically. Right. And I think it's whatever you make of it. And a lot of times it, it's your Lisa Phillips that buy the tickets because they want to see some good ideas because the bank might want to, mm. you know, have, have a working relationship with them. So if anybody wants to explore that, I'm open. <laughs> Thank you. Um, tell me, what fears do you have about asking for money? Is it, um, I'm not going to have the right paperwork, I'm not going to... Uh, I like to no. I don't know. <laughs> <don't know. laughs> yes, rejection. Fear of rejection. Yeah. Anyone else? <clears throat> My concern was I wanted a year here in this town just working to see what the year did because mm -hmm. there's ups and downs at, at least in my business there's there's mm -hmm. dry spells and there's swamp work and and so before I go asking for a loan or an expansion I want to see how the area did for that first year mm -hmm. I'm almost at the end of it but <laughs> uh, yeah that was my biggest concern was seeing the nature of how the business yeah, ran for a year. Yeah, having historical experience to know see where what to go ups, next. We'll see what the ups and downs did and when they were so that I can't go for a loan and then October hits and there's nothing for three weeks. I'm like, huh, well, so you want your money, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on to some fun stuff. Cash flow. This is a slide from Sally last week, but um, your <coughs> idea to stop paying our bills was pure genius. Cash flow really is the timing of cash coming in and cash going out. So if you have cash coming in and no cash going out, then cash flow is going to be spectacular. So uh, we're going to talk about some things on how you can plan <coughs> for cash flow. There are very simple models to this, and there are very complicated models I don't understand, but we'll just talk about the basics of cash flow. So cash comes in from sales, from loan proceeds, um, investments, the sale of assets, and then obviously goes out for paying operating expenses, direct expenses, wages, uh, the purchase of assets. So cash is what keeps your business functioning. It's the livelihood of your business. Uh, you obviously need profits. You want each sale to be profitable, but more important is the timing of cash. If you have that rent payment coming up and you've made no sales, then there's going to be a cash crisis. Um, new startups should fully understand that running out of cash is one of the primary reasons that new, belt, new businesses fail after launch. They didn't have enough cash to start. What, and what is enough cash to start? So an accurate cash flow projection can alert you of this trouble far before the trouble strikes. And I would say uh, cash flow projection is a, 
ever-changing document that you might go into this thinking one thing and then, oh, well, sales did not happen that way. So you need to adjust that. And sometimes that's weekly and sometimes that's monthly. And then when things normalize and you know that October is a slow month, then you can project out for the whole year what this year is going to look like. So cash flow, just that, the flow of cash. So coming in um, to form your cash flow projection. This is the two kind of steps I recommend. Uh, cash that's coming in. So think about I'm going to have cash to start my business and then I'm going to add in all the cash that I think are going to be received from various sources. So I'm going to start with 5000 and I know that I'm going to have a $2,000 sale. Uh, I know I'm going to have 500 come in this week. Uh, so you're making a list of how much cash is coming in and when you think you'll get it. And then the second phase of that is going out. So I'm going to make a list of the amounts and dates of upcoming cash outlays. So I know rents due this date, utilities, I'm going to have to purchase some inventory if sales go like I think they are. I'm going to have to pay wages, office supplies, and the list goes on and on. So let's back up and look at, can I have the mouse? Yes. Thank you. Some cash flow examples. So we we're talking about um, cash coming in. Let's see if I can find my example here. Cash flow in its simplest form is just a list of cash coming in and cash going out. So I have 5,000 I think is gonna come in and then later in the month I'm gonna have another 1,000 and then maybe 500. So for this month, I think 11,000 is going to come in. And then going out, I know I've got some bills coming out. Oh, this thing is cooperating. Okay, so you can see, well, that would be negative cash flow. So in its simplest form, you you know that cash coming in this month 6,500, cash going out this month 6,300. So I should be right side up positive cash flow of $200. So sometimes there's going to be factors you don't know. Well, I don't know about this part of the income. So if I don't get those sales or I don't get that job, I could be $300 upside down for for the month. A little more sophisticated. I don't know if it's sophisticated or not will be to actually put down what dates you think these things are going to happen. So I start my business on the first day of August and I have starting cash of let's say $3,000 and then I have this shirt printing business. So on the 15th I'm going to have to buy shirts. We'll skip the description and that shirt order it's going to cost me $2,000. So I had 3,000, mouse don't fail me now, and I'm going to spend 2,000 of that, so I'm down 2,000, and then by the 25th I have finished those shirts. So I'm going to mail this invoice, but an um, invoice in the mail does not count as income. So you're still waiting for that customer to pay you. And then you know that by the first of the month, rent is due. And rent is $1,000. So there goes all of your money. And then finally, to make you sweat, that customer paid you the second. And you have $1,000. So you're back right side up. Maybe. So there are all kinds of tools besides Excel. Excel um, is just what we had at hand, but as a new business, you might be purchasing Quicken or QuickBooks, or you might have an accountant that could prepare some statements like this for you. But I always say, uh, it's called the checkbook method. I think this is a really simple way to start your cash flow is to think of it in terms of what date is money gonna go out and what date is money gonna come in. And when you don't know some of those factors like sales, then you kind of have to set that as your goal. I need 5,000 in sales. 
And so when we talk here in a little bit about you may not be profitable, but you need that cash to come in the door. So I might have to sell these shirts as a loss this time because I need that cash in my hand right now to go make my rent payment. So it's really the concept of forming a cash flow statement. Any questions on that? Um, a more formal cash flow statement will look something like this. It's by month. And so we started January with 5,000 in the bank. We had some sales, so we had total cash in of 9,500. And these are all of our expenses, which totaled 11,000. So my cash at the end of the month was 3340. So that's the amount I start the next month with. And the same thing happens month and month again. And you can see by July, we just haven't kept up. We've had more expenses than income. So we started July at a negative cash position. So this might indicate that we need more cash to start with, or we need that family or bank loan so that our starting cash at the beginning is a little higher. Any questions about that? Let's get out of this. Anything you want to add to that? No, Maybe no. Cash flow <laughs> expert? I got to bring my students over here. <laughs> I think it's an overwhelming thought when you want to start a business or you want to buy a business or even when you have a business, like how am I going to plan this out? We went to a meeting and the um, city director said, you know, budgeting is like you telling me what the balance of your checking account is going to be this day next year. And I was like, oh, I can do that. And then I was like, wait, I don't know what I'm going to spend at Walmart next week. So who are we kidding? I can't pick what my checking account balance is going to be at this time next week. But I also think that with enough practice, you get really good at these things. And one month, if you're lucky enough to be in a business that one month looks like the next month, next month is really easy. But if you're not in that type of business, which I think most here are not in that type of business, then that becomes a little more unpredictable. And so you don't know that sales number, you don't know that income number. And so that has to become your goal. Well, like, um, I always tell my students is like, it's, of course, I'm, I kind of make fun of the accounting office downstairs, and I tell them that you know anyone can do the accounting because anyone can plug in numbers, but to forecast, and that's kind of what you're doing here is you're forecasting. Mm -hmm. That takes experience, it takes knowledge, it takes you know. So, so forecasting is what I tell them. If you ever learn to forecast, you're worth your weight in gold. You'll get hired anywhere. Mm -hmm. Forecasting, and so just like quicken, you know, when I used to farm, I used to I kept. Quick and as soon as it came out, I, I used it for about 15 or 20 years. And and as you, like when you look at last year's, you can compare it to this year's. And so, you know, you would, and the living document, I love that. Because I would always like, as I would, like the year would progress, I would compare it to what I had forecasted. And normally, you know, there were always mistakes or, you know, misforecasts. But you can kind of sure. keep, keep looking at those things and... Uh, the better you get at it, or the more you do it, the better you get at it, I think, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there's nothing wrong with having this conversation with your accountant or with your banker. Um, like I said, odds are they've seen something similar, or they can say, hey, let's think about this. Or they can say, hey, don't get wound up about this. This is okay. You know, we'll work through this. Well, and I, the first, I remember the very first loan I made, the coming in, coming in and going out, the very first loan I made, a banker told me, he said, uh, he said, well, normally no one ever forgets any of the cash coming in. They always <laughs> remember everything. They, get it. They, get it they, they don't forget any. They might over forecast on some of that. But, but always, you know, you'll always forget one or two things about the cash going out. You know, it's like it's that something that you don't pay every month, like insurance or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. you know. That, so, so, it's, so always rack your brain over the cash going out mm -hmm. about what you're going to forget. And when you get into this, you'll know, you'll know that maybe I should ask that customer to pay me now, or maybe I should ask that customer for a deposit on a construction job so that I have some of that cash up front. Uh, and then also your vendors, places you're ordering inventory and supplies from, how long can I stretch them? And that's not to pay, to push off bills you need to pay, but it's also buying you time. So if I order supplies and I pay that vendor day one, that cash is out. Whereas if I could pay that vendor like day 10, or if they'd invoice me and I could pay them in 30 days, then that buys you 30 days of cash so that you can operate on that while you're waiting for more sales to get in. 
So it, that's why I think it's an overwhelming process. You got to just start simple and then build up to more complicated uh, projection models. To me, uh, the software is kind of a challenge for new businesses. What do you buy? What can help you do these things? And that's why you use Excel. Um, usually you can find a free version or a relatively cheap version of Excel to build it in. Uh, Quicken and QuickBooks. Quicken is fairly easy to understand. QuickBooks will take you a little time to set up, which an accountant can help you do, but I think you reap the benefits of knowing these things and not having to do them on LegalPad. Uh, what experience do you all have with software? What would you recommend or not recommend? I've got QuickBooks and it is really complicated. It can be. <laughs> It can be. I always hear um, to have your accountant set that up before you ever get started on it, and that makes it using it um, much easier. And I like uh, yeah, makes I me scared of it just it in that. She did great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just to get all those accounts tied correctly, uh, but once you have it built, then you know, I think it saves you a ton of time. Um, I help run my boyfriend's business, Prince and Welding, and I use the uh, Google. Um, I don't know what they're called, but it's like Google Excel and stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. Google Sheets. Google Sheets, Sheets and all yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And I love it because I can access it from any computer anywhere. And every time you type something, it automatically saves. I'm like the queen of like exiting out of something without hitting save. So like once you get done typing, it automatically saves it all. So if your computer crashes or it dies because you don't charge it all the time, um, it's really, really nice to use. And I type a lot of documents and stuff, and I make flyers, and it's super simple. And it's free. And it's yeah. super free. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's great. I can access it on my cell phone. I can send it to anybody really easily. It's awesome. It's super cool. Yeah. I like it a lot. Yeah. I use it a lot. Yeah. All cool kids. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Okay, so kind of uh, expanding on what we're talking about in cash flow <coughs> is that you can be profitable. So if your accountant prints out for you your income statement, it can show that you are profitable, you are making money. And then you look at your checkbook and realize, I don't think I'm making money. Mm -hmm. And so there can be a difference in the two. That's why we say cash flow is important. Profit is also important. But cash flow is uh, maybe more important because there are items that are gonna happen in cash flow that are not gonna end up on the income statement. And so we've made some examples here. One is if you put cash into your business to get it started, that's not considered income. And so that will not be on the income statement. You're not, not gonna pay taxes on money you gave to your business. So that's not gonna appear, but that appeared in your checkbook. Uh, and also in the same thing, if you get a bank loan, and you deposit that bank loan into your checking account, you, that's not income, so that's not gonna show up on your income statement. And then when you repay that loan, it's not an expense. So it's not gonna show up on your expenses. Or if you decide, I'm making enough money I can pay myself back for that loan I gave myself, those owner draws back out are also not expenses. So it's very possible that you can look at an income statement or a profit and loss statement and it shows doing awesome and then you can look at the checkbook and realize you know there there are some things happening that are not um, sinking here so that's why it's important to keep your income statement and visit with your accountant about how you're doing there but also keep a good idea of your cash flow statement and items that are coming in and out and two knowing I haven't paid this bill I haven't paid this bill I have this income coming out. So there's always going to be uh, adjustments that you're going to need to make to both and some extra thinking to apply to, to both statements. But don't let them mislead you. Okay, Coulter's going to take over here 10 expert tips on making cash flow, managing cash flow as a new business. Yeah, and at least you kind of touched on some of these that are already up here. Um, but number one, know when you'll break even. A lot of people try to get caught up in what the profit is going to be, uh, I encourage you to start with what, where you're going to need to just break even. That way it'll help you set goals for the future to see what you need to, um, to make a profit. 
uh, keep your eye on cash flow management, which is what she was kind of uh, going through there. Some people might look at it monthly. Um, some look at it weekly. I, I'd encourage you to look at it daily um, to see what you're spending. See, track those expenses daily to help you maintain, to maybe look at what you could do a week out um, in that, that way to help projections, because it's not easy to project. Always maintain a cash reserve. A lot of people uh, want to tie up all their money in operating, um, but you never know when something might happen that uh, will cost you a lot, a non-reoccurring cost that will cost you a lot more, just a one-time thing. So it's always a good thing to have a cash reserve in case you have a bad year. That will help bail you out so you can keep going. Uh, manage funds better. I think that one's uh, pretty self-explanatory, like I was saying. Uh, sometimes you'll also need a, another set of eyes. So if you're the only one doing cash flow, managing your cash flow, reading all the everyday numbers, it might be helpful to have another set of eyes to maybe see that that expense that you're spending on might not be quite worth it in your eyes, in their eyes. Uh, collect receivables immediately, which that one can be tough to do because obviously the next one is extend payables where you can. So if you're doing that, you're kind of in a battle, right? But there is some truth to that. A lot of people will tend to let their receivables go, you know, past 30 days, past 60 days. Well, then at, you know, past 90 days, are you actually going to, when are you going to start receiving that money? It's important to get a good grasp on your receivables, whether it's, you know, calling, checking in, when are you going to get this? So you can kind of help with that projection of money that, that helps that um, to see what you can use to operate money with. And this kind of goes with the um, collect receivables immediately. Offer discounts to collect payables early. Um, you know, say if you give me this, maybe I'll take $50 off uh, that payable if you can get it to me quicker, um, which will in turn help you have some more operating money quicker. Um, extend payables where you can. Just, it's not necessarily a bad thing like Lisa was saying, but it'll just help you to have a little bit more cash to operate with um, while you kind of extend out that those payables. Uh, spend only on essentials. That one can be tough for some people. Uh, sometimes you'll see people run personal expenses through their, their business, um, which can really hurt their business because that's not really what they needed to do to have that operating cash. Um, it's really what you just need to do is spend essentials only for the business that you'll think you'll need and use. Uh, be smart about hiring. That one's uh, pretty self-explanatory. I, The case I would say if you know someone's going to be there and spend longevity for it, go out and spend the money for them. Pay for them if they're going to be good help uh, just so you can get them. Uh, I, and think, then, I think you need to look at your employees as investments right rather than charity correct yeah um, like I said longevity investments if you think that that's a good investment go ahead and spend the money for that investment you're exactly right um, and then make the best use of technology like we were kind of touching on earlier with Google Sheets there's plenty of stuff out there on the internet you can do and use it capably to help you run your business so that was kind of just touching on um, what you expanded on just a second ago okay any questions, any additions to that? I did forget I have a handout in your sheet that is the profit and loss statement or the income statement. <coughs> and it says, let's see, yes, profit and loss statement. It's just an example. And you can see how that might look different than a cash flow statement. I think it's important to keep both documents. Okay, we're going to move on to applying for a bank loan. Things that sound scary that aren't really scary. I don't think they're scary. Uh, so if you decide that one of your sources of capital is going to be a bank loan, uh, you, we will prepare you a little on what that might look like when you come to the bank and ask for money. Uh, there will be a loan application meeting, so call set up a time to meet with a loan officer, a commercial loan officer, presumably, uh, to discuss what your financing might be. 
um, come in knowing kind of how much money you're talking about. Um, he, the loan officer will usually work through that with you and determine a final number, but have a ballpark <coughs> idea of how much and for how long you want it. You might know that I only need this money for six months, or you might know I need this for at least five years. Uh, you might not know how long you're gonna need this for, and that's something that Coulter and I help the loan officers work through is to figure out can this business model pay this loan back in five years or do they need 15 years? Um, and then also collateral. So I'm asking for a $100,000 loan, what might I secure that with? I'm gonna secure that with my name and guarantee to repay, but there also might be something tangible that the bank would want to take to ensure a repayment of the loan. Uh, also bring your business plan and the business plan should include a balance sheet and a profit and loss projection and I've included both in your packet a sample balance sheet what that might look like and a sample profit and loss projection and then historical trends so if it's an operating and already up and running business that you have bring your historical trends in the form of balance sheets and profit and loss or old tax returns or if it's a business you're buying ask that seller for a copy of their financial statement so you can get a good idea and so that the loan officer can get a good idea of what this business has done in the past and what you're gonna do with it in the future. And then personal guarantee, like we've talked about before, there's a good chance the bank is gonna want not only your business to borrow but for you to personally guarantee it. So you'll wanna bring your personal tax returns and your personal balance sheet. And I've included in your packet a sample of a personal balance sheet. That looks a little different than a business balance sheet. And you can see the personal balance sheet talks a lot more about personal assets, retirement funds, your personal home, um, your vehicles, your vehicle loans. Some forms are just one or two pages. This one's a little lengthier, but it helps you think through all the things that you might own and all the things you might owe. So you bring all of this to the bank and you discuss it with the loan officer and then chances are you're going to leave all of that with the loan officer and they are going to get to work or Coulter and I are going to get to work on processing the loan application. And so you think, what is the bank looking for? Like how am I going to qualify for a loan or what are some things that might lead them to say no? So this is um, really just the beginning of what we are looking at, but it's a good, I'm sure David discusses it in his classes. The, five C's of credit. So we'll be looking at character, capacity, collateral, capital, and conditions. Uh, we do some number crunching and some ratio analysis, but really this is the heart of what we're getting at. Uh, character is not like it sounds. It's not a, this guy is shady. We don't believe in his character. It's something tangible. And so something tangible is credit <coughs> score and your history of payment performances. So have you owed up to your obligations in the past? And that might be an indicator of whether you will stand by your obligations going forward. Uh, character, I would also say, is your management ability. Are they kind of lost on these numbers? Are they getting it? Are they willing to ask for help? Um, or are they not? Then, yes. We had one time, and it was from Bank of the Panhandle, a class on repairing your credit mm -hmm. score. And it, correct me if I'm wrong, but whomever you bank with, they usually have somebody that can help you go back and start fixing your credit. Yes, for sure. We do host a class on credit and what makes your credit score go down, what makes it go up. Uh, if it's to the point where you need correction as in you need to uh, visit with each of your creditors to get your payments lowered or to consolidate well, debt we I have resources for that oh that's true if, if there's things you need to argue and dispute and that's something you can do quite early so that mm -hmm. when you start getting ready yes for sure um i always think that like high school business class should talk to you about your credit score because sometimes you just jump into the real world and don't realize what you might be doing to your credit score and those are good discussions to have early on and if you didn't have that knowledge and now you have a credit score that's not spectacular there are things you can do 
Uh, there are free resources just like the SCORE, and I can't remember what the other one is called. Uh, there's an organization at Amarillo, it's free. You sit down and meet with them and they help you go through your credit and, and let's see if we can get these consolidated. Let's see if we can get lower interest rates on these so that you can start paying your bills on time and get your credit scores to move up. There are lots of other tools. So yes, if you need help with that, we can definitely get you the or right resources. Or if you resources. bank somewhere else, they yep. probably have someone too. For sure. You don't even have to make everybody come to you, right? Well, we like for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was being nice. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like we're the best at it, but yes. <laughs> yes, other banks will be very helpful too. So capacity is, um, we call it the primary source of repayment. You're asking for this loan what is your ability to repay this loan? And then collateral is kind of the secondary source of repayment. If my primary source, my capacity fails, what's my backup plan? So if you're not able to pay me back, pay the bank back out of your primary source of business, your sales and your cash flow, that fails, then we'll start selling inventory or start liquidating whatever you've offered as collateral. Uh, and then capital is, in short, the down payment. How much skin do you have in the game versus how much does the bank have in the game? So if you come to the bank and you say, I'm gonna put 50% down. I need 100,000, you know, and I'm gonna put 100,000 in, bank's gonna put 100,000 in. We would feel better about that. It lowers our risk substantially. Whereas if you come, I need 100,000 and I don't have any money to put in, then you really have no skin in the game and you could maybe disappear and we not get our money. So uh, that just lowers the bank's risk. Uh, all banks will have different risk tolerances. Uh, some banks will play on some pretty big gambles and some will not want to gamble at all. So that may be based on the bank, but the expect to have to put some money down if that's 5% or if that's 5,000 on all you have, um, that discussion will come up in this meeting. And then conditions, what's not only the amount of the loan, but what is the intended use? And do you need uh, monthly payments? Do you need quarterly payments? Lots of farmers need annual payments because there's only one check coming in a year. Uh, so you'll have a discussion about the conditions of the loan as well. Any questions about all of that? Um, with your collateral and capital, if mm -hmm. you have, let's say, you have a lot of collateral, a lot of equipment and stuff, but you mm -hmm. have very little capital to put down, do you guys sometimes like take that into effect and kind of balance that out? Yeah, so if you own a lot of equipment and you have no loans against it, then you oh. could take a loan out against that okay. equipment and then apply it toward your business. Okay. And that's something a loan officer is good about working through, taking a look at what all you have and what are some good options for you. We're certainly not advisors in that, but can help you kind of mm -hmm. pinpoint some sources of cash that you might have not realized you had. Yeah. Good question. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone have any bank application fears? <laughs> Bad experiences? <laughs> I don't know if I would ask that. Good experiences? We will take uh, the numbers that the customer provides us and compare it against the industry, which I think is super helpful. And for farmers, we can take month by month and build out a cash flow for them to know what months are they going to need cash and what months are they going to have a cash surplus. Just having that conversation with your loan officer is worth the interest rate that you're paying on that loan in my opinion. And two, when you're putting together this packet, like you said, it's good, um, not that I'm encouraging shopping, but you need to find the right fit for a loan officer for you. It's like saying all hairdressers are the same or all massage mm -hmm. therapists are the same. You know from experience that they may not be and you might mesh with one better than the other. And just because you've visited with one loan officer here doesn't mean the guy across the hall is gonna be better or worse. And um, you might have standing relationships at another bank. Those are good places to start having the conversation. And if you feel like, oh, I didn't really get what I needed there, then you've already got that packet. You can go see what else you can learn. <coughs> Barbara is on the Shark Tank. She graduated, I can't remember what year now, as a teacher and she taught school for a year in New York City and she decided she needed to supplement her income so she started renting apartments on the side. And then she found there was a lack of rental data for New York City, so she started compiling 
rental data and real estate data and years later she sold her business for 66 million dollars she found <laughs> she found a need you know and she fulfilled that need and a lot of things we read about starting businesses is make sure you're filling that need if there's not a question to answer if there's not a need then maybe there's not a need for that business so she really found a niche but she says the joy is in getting there the beginning years of starting your business the camaraderie when you're in the pit together or the best years of your life might be the most stressful so rather than being focused on when you get big and powerful, if you can, just get the juice out of it. Don't miss it.